Looking for strategies to help you protect your portfolio in these uncertain times? Visit robblack.com. Robblack.com. Powered by EP Wealth. I'm Rob Black. Let's talk what's happening on Wall Street, investing, maybe some hints, tips, tricks on how to retire, and much, much more. Um, yesterday was a down day. And it was pretty consistently down. Listen to this. The Nasdaq was down 1.08. The Dow was down 1.08%. And the S&P 500 was down close 1.1%. I'd say all three um, reacting to some of the negativity. <clears throat> and another bank is now being lined up to go down. And sometimes these are self-realizing. It just... You start the ball rolling and it doesn't stop. So would I own any regional bank right now? Me personally, no. Would I try to buy, catch the bottom in one of these? Me personally, no. It's a little too self-fulfilling. PacWest was down 27% yesterday. The relative calm after JP Morgan scooped up First Republic Bank last all of uh, one day. Two other West Coast lenders, PacWest and Western Alliance, both tumbled in a sign. Investors still smell blood in regional banks. Today is Fed Day. Happy Fed Decision Day. I How can anyone get excited about Fed Day? We have inflation sizzling at still uncomfortably high levels. Chairman Jerome Pro- Powell is expected to announce Central Bank's 10th interest rate hike this afternoon slash morning, depending on what coast you're on. Many economists expect this rate increase could be the grand finale. That sounds nice, right? But with three banks down and two more in the wings, will the Fed continue to raise rates? You can honestly say, without too much delirium, that regional banks are going to stop lending or they're going to cut lending. Anyhow, um, let's move forward. What do we have? Um, Headlines, 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 right? Biden is sending active duty military to the border. The Department of Defense is deploying 1,500 troops to the U.S.-Mexico border to assist with non-law enforcement responsibilities such as providing for support for detention and processing of migrants. Title 42, the COVID era policy that allowed authorities to swiftly expel migrants from the U.S. expires next week. The Biden administration is expecting a spike in border crossings. There was some really fantastic research done recently on how inflation would be higher in the United States if we didn't have low cost labor. And that's got a lot of people freaked out. Because we also have a lot of job openings that aren't going filled by people that want them. That's got a lot of people freaked out. Layoffs jumped to the highest level since the year 2020. Number of job openings in the United States dropped to a nearly two-year low in March, and layoffs increased to their highest point since December 2020. In the bad news is good news world, the Fed will be pleased that the boiling hot labor market is cooling off, and that puts less inflation pressure on the Fed's decisions to justify their pausing a potential rate hike or slowing the rate hikes down. That has to be the story of the day so far. But again, it's all going to change when the Federal Reserve announces their numbers. Yesterday, you had to almost feel bad for Chegg, the popular one-stop shop site for all things schoolwork. It's worried that students increasingly view ChatGPT as their go-to study buddy. Stock got crushed yesterday. CEO came out late in the afternoon and goes, I think y'all are overdoing it. The buzzword of earnings season was AI. On earnings calls last week, Meta, Alphabet, Microsoft, and Amazon collectively dropped the term AI 168 times. Keep in mind, earnings calls are typically about 50 minutes. TV is about to get a lot stranger as the writing strike continues to um, add day after day. 
shows like Stephen Colbert, Jimmy Fallon, Jimmy Kimmel, Seth Meyers began airing reruns after 11,000 plus writers from the Writers Guild of America went on strike late Monday. Saturday Night Live is shutting down, meaning that this Saturday's planned Pete Davidson hosted episode will be replaced by a rerun. Yeah, not good, huh? Get ready for more game shows. Get ready for more reality TV. As this uh, this won't really affect Hollywood for 30, 60, 70. Yeah, depending on how long it lasts, it's going to really affect the fall season. Apple and Google are working together in a rare show of, of alliance. They're trying to reduce the stalking from Bluetooth trackers like Apple's AirTags. That was nice to see. AirTags are a great little product, but when you throw them in the back of your girlfriend's car so you can see where she's going, they're kind of evil. Or something worse. Ford is cutting prices on its electric Mustang Mach-E by $1,000 to $4,000 while Tesla bumped up prices for some of its EVs this week. What else do we have to hit today? Um, Amazon wants to equip Alexa with a chat GPT-like features. A leaked document viewed by a Business Insider revealed that Amazon wants to focus on entertainment features for Alexa. Those include conversational video searches, personal recommendations, and storytelling capabilities. Feels like Alexa's thinking versus fetching from a database, one internal memo said. The upgrade will feature Amazon's own generative AI instead of using OpenAI's technology. That's kind of nice. I was reading that one man comes home to his children, CEO of Snap, Evan Spiegel, and he has ChatGPT create stories for them. They put in buzzwords like princess, Happy ending, fairy tale, unicorn. I haven't gotten that creative with it. AWS co founder Charlie Bell joined Microsoft in 2021 to run its $20 billion cybersecurity business. Bell dished to analysts on why he made the move, how he met Sadia Nandela, and such. It is really important that when you Amazon Web Services is considered one of the top three inventions in the last 20 years, along with the iPhone. AI is going to be thrown down soon in that same conversation. What else do we have? Startups. Um, if you're a startup and you're looking for cash, your valuation is being slashed from 60 to 80% typically right now. That's pretty brutal. And those are the people that use things like Amazon Web Services. 800-516-1220 to each calls on the air. It's 800-516-1220 to each calls on the air. Drop me an email, rob at robblackshow.com. It's rob at robblackshow.com. So here we go again. Some uh, regional banks under pressure. Fed Reserve. On Friday, we get the jobs report. 30. This is a busy week for Wall Street. I'm Rob Black. Got an event coming up this Sunday in Marin. It's a portfolio review event. If you want your portfolio review, it's for you. If not, it's not for you. You can find out more at robblackshow.com. It's robblackshow.com. This Sunday, join Rob Black in San Rafael for Pints and Portfolios, a less formal event at a local watering hole for those close to retirement with 500000 or more in investable assets. Drop by Sunday afternoon from 1 to 4 for a little sunshine, some financial chit-chat, and a complimentary portfolio review or financial snapshot from Dan Fetterman, CFP from EP Wealth Advisors. Whether you're on the road to retirement or on already there, this financial snapshot can provide you with a second opinion analysis of where you are and highlight areas for improvement and opportunities for growth. Go to robblackshow.com and click the events tab. Find Pints and Portfolios and click to register. You'll answer a few simple questions about your situation and your confirmation email will provide all the details on the event and how to schedule your portfolio review. Space is limited and registration is required. So go to robblackshow.com today. That's robblackshow.com. Today's Federal Reserve announcement, probably not going to have any surprises. The stock market is projecting a 100% probability that the Fed will approve a quarter percentage point increase, thus raising the target range to five to five and a quarter percent. 
what's amazing about this is this has been marching on since March 2022. Patrick is on. So we're about 14 months in. Let's bring in Patrick O'Hare. We are starting to see some of the ramifications of higher interest rates, some of the risks that regional banks took. We've seen three of the four largest bank failures in the United States this year. Maybe more on the way from what the action on Wall Street is telling us. Let's bring in Patrick O'Hare with briefing.com. Mr. O'Hare, how are you? Hey, good morning, Rob. I'm doing okay. Thanks. Good, good. Um, any mystery today with the Fed rate hike? Because it looks like it's a, almost a done deal. Mm -hmm. Well, there's still some mystery around it. Um, you know, the Fed funds futures market, to your point, you know, shows a pretty strong probability. It's north of 80 percent that the Fed will raise another 25 basis points. And I think that the Fed uh, doesn't like to, uh, you know, necessarily surprise the market. And we'll see that kind of as a, as a tacit blessing to, you know, to move ahead with this rate hike. Um, but where I, you know, what I'm referring to in terms of there being a little bit of mystery around it, though, is that um, I think that, you know, the, the, the price action in the regional bank stocks yesterday was quite unsettling. Um, there have yeah. been many reports that indicate that the Fed has access to a senior loan officer survey going into this meeting that the public does not yet have, but will shortly. Um, and so there's a little bit of chatter that, you know, maybe there's there's more to this regional bank story than, than meets the eye and could potentially compel the Fed to, you know, to not rate, raise rates uh, today uh, if they see something in that. Uh, senior loan officer survey that really, you know, gives them a, a credit tightening scare, if you will. Um, but beyond that, um, there's also some mystery in terms of what they're going to say to try to thread this needle of uh, perhaps pausing, but without giving the market license to rally too much, um, knowing that the inflation rate is still well above the Fed's 2% target. So, it's a, uh, as I communicated in my page one column this morning, it's, you know, Fed Chair Powell has quite the communication job on his hands today. Uh, and there's, you know, notwithstanding what the Fed Funds Futures Market is, is suggesting the Fed will do in terms of the rate hike today, I would argue that there is still quite a bit of mystery around it. Interesting. Um, what are you expecting the Fed to do a is the Fed going to do anything for the regional banks? Is that a, a Treasury secretary? Is there going to be any call to action here? Um, or do we just sit by and watch it happen one after another? Because that's kind of what it looks like from a distance. Yeah, I think, it. you know, I think that uh, if it's not seen, you know, uh, you know, it could, there could be some financial stability risks without there necessarily being a systemic risk, I think. And I, I believe that's kind of why, you know, that first republic go the way that it did and you didn't uh and you're not necessarily getting the uh the explicit guarantee of deposit it's kind of a de facto guarantee but um but i think that they don't want to perpetuate that moral hazard risk of you know always riding to the rescue and you know from a um uh, you know, a systemic standpoint, as you know, as much as people will hem and haw over it, you know, the the uh, those uh, two big to fail banks, if you will, are in good shape, and uh, and that's you know probably an overriding consideration. So, um, uh, so I just I don't think that they want to like necessarily come out and and, and imply that they're just going to you know rescue every small bank uh, that happens to go under here. Um, so, um, and that's kind of adding probably to the level of anxiousness among not only depositors at those banks, but also investors within those banks, um, which recognize that, um, you know, there may be more trouble ahead as far as uh, worsening credit quality conditions uh, as a lot of commercial loans come up to be refinanced uh, and uh, will be refinanced at higher rates than when they were first originated. And that will create some added repayment burdens um, and some, you know, more credit stresses that, you know, are not yet showing up uh, necessarily in terms of, 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 you know, a debilitating widening in credit spreads or, or, or anything of that nature, but which is, you know, one of those 
boogeyman's you know out there on the horizon and why I think that there's been a lot of uh, skittishness surrounding the regional bank stocks. So the Fed's looking at inflation. The Fed probably has their eyeball on loan origination out of regional banks. But the Fed also has their eyes on the employment reports. Friday, we get the jobless numbers. Today, we got an ADP employment change report. You wrote in your page one column at briefing.com where, in your words, what, what did you see when the ADP report? Was it positive, negative? Was it negative? It's good news for the market. Was it positive? That's bad news for the market. How do we read today's news? Well, you know, it should be construed really as a positive, I think, for the market because it was a type of report that, you know, you know, threads the needle of, of a soft landing view. Um, you had some moderation and, and pay growth coupled with some still solid increases in, in private sector payrolls. Um, but, you know, it might be that the 296,000 jobs that were added to private sector payrolls, according to ADP, could still be looked at as being too much, you know, as far as the Fed is concerned. Um, I think that they, uh, even though there's plenty of um, pundits who are arguing that the Fed doesn't need to mess with a good situation, you're getting good payroll growth and you're seeing, you know, a moderation in, in overall inflation and, um, and, and payroll and, in, you know, and wage inflation uh, without really the full impact of the prior rate hikes having having hit home yet. And so, you know, they're kind of like suggesting, you know, you don't want to uh, over tinker here and invite a much harder landing. So, uh, but this report, I think, uh, should have been construed really more as a good thing by the market um, because it does fit that soft landing narrative. Uh, however, you know, you just don't know what the Fed is thinking yet. Uh, and I think that you've seen a pretty muted reaction in terms of the market environment today because everyone's really just sitting on their hands waiting to see what, uh, what the Fed decides, uh, how the decision goes down. Will it be unanimous or will it be some dissent? And then, of course, what Fed Chair Powell says at his press conference. Yeah, that will be interesting because um, recently the, the action or the fireworks has been in the press conference. How about earnings season? Um, you obviously have a big job. You cover the markets with briefing.com, and we were at the tail end of earnings season, but there's still some big boys out there like Apple and AMD reported last night. I saw that you uh, put together little thoughts on earnings. How are they going? Well, they're certainly going, you know, better than expected. Um, you know, we come into uh, today uh, with um, – um, you know the the, the earnings, the blended earnings go, growth rate down about three and three point seven percent. So it's declined still. But when we were coming into the start of the reporting period, it was projected to be um, uh, down six point seven percent. So so looking uh, pretty good in terms of just as far as beat rates are concerned. But you know the caveat, of course, is that estimates have been marked down considerably going into the uh, reporting period, and so. Uh, so companies had a lower hurdle to get over, um, you know, and, and I think that, you know, one of the things that's kind of standing out uh, coming out of this period, though, is that you're not getting really any sharp uh, cuts to analysts' earnings estimates as we look over the forward 12-month period. I mean, in fact, they've gone up uh, since this reporting period began. So you're starting to hear a narrative that would suggest or that does suggest that the um, that the decline we saw in earnings estimates throughout most of last year, um, you know, that that has basically that, you know, the earnings downturn has been fully accounted for now. Um, you know, as you and I have talked about in more recent weeks, I, I don't necessarily agree with that because, uh, you know, we think that, um, you know, the, the, the lag effect of the Fed's prior rate hikes will We'll hit home, you know, more conservatively here in coming months, and then that will prompt a downward revision to earnings estimates. And, you know, one point on that, if I may real quickly, what's interesting mm -hmm. is that you have a Fed funds futures market right now that's pricing in the likelihood of three rate cuts before the end of the year uh, in September, November, and December. But that view is predicated on the idea that the rate cuts will be driven by a much weaker economic environment. Um, but what the conflict is, is that you have earnings estimates uh, going up, you know, for the back half of the year. And uh, that just doesn't make sense to us. And so something is off kilter there. We'll find out, you know, soon enough, so to speak. But, um, 
but it's an interesting dynamic. And uh, but for right now, it's been a source of stabilization for the equity market to see that there hasn't been a real uh, uh, significant cut to earnings estimates coming out of this first quarter earnings reporting period. This has been probably the messiest period of time that I could remember that the Federal Reserve has operated in when we start taking in layoffs and discharges and what sectors are doing well, what sectors are doing poorly and hiring. Um, let me just uh, end it there because we got less than a minute. I'll give you a good plug. Thanks very much. It's briefing.com. It's Patrick O'Hare. He's with us every week. He's got a page one column, steady with an asterisk ahead of the FOMC meeting. He puts together a lot of research and ideas. Um, on what the current market conditions are for briefing.com. He starts every day with his page one. He ends the week with his big picture. Uh, Briefing.com also has earning calendars. They have breaking news and how it's in play. It's one of my favorite things to go through twice during the day uh, to see what they as a shop have found important to report to you, the investor. And uh, for instance, Starbucks brews up strong report. uh, Starbucks brews up strong results in China. And uh, you get to learn a little bit more without having to listen to the conference call. I think that's super helpful at times. For people who want to check in on information, there's a big write-up today on AMD Advanced Micro Devices. Uh, we knew their numbers were going to be bad because the computer industry is struggling with desktops at this point in time. A lot of research out there, and you got to get your hands on some of I use briefing.com and others, but I really, really like Patrick O'Hare and briefing.com. You can find me online at robblackshow.com. This interview featured on The Rob Black Show is brought to you by EP Wealth. Learn more at robblack.com. Olive Garden. I know you're saying, is that the unlimited possible company? Yes. Exactly what America needs. All you can eat pasta. Breadsticks. No, thank you. Uh, Darden Restaurants is buying Ruth Chris Steakhouse for $715 million. Ruth's will join Darden's fine dining portfolio, which includes the Capitol Grill and Eddie V's. Uh, Ruth's Chris is a was a stock that's been around since 2005, if I remember correctly. And it's just not a company that we need publicly traded. I know there's a lot of actual deals going on right now in the world of restaurants. Subway's put themselves up for sale, looking for at least $10 billion to end more than five decades of family ownership. But back to Ruth's Chris. Um, The Steakhouse first quarter earnings report is expected to be released before the bell on Friday. The company said it's canceling the conference call scheduled for that morning. Ruth's reported same store sales growth of 4.5%. You got to admit that if you've ever been at Ruth's Chris and their whole how they sear steaks and it's pretty consistent. Ruth's was founded in 1965. After Ruth Fertel bought Chris a steakhouse in New Orleans, the terms of the sale kept her from reusing the name at other location. So she chose to name the new locations Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. I know, isn't that funny? Company went public, yep, in 2005. Um, again, when it comes to owning stocks, let's say, I think Warren Buffett once said, pretend you have a punch card that only has 20 punches on it wisely and if you only had 20 punches and you knew you only had to go for for me when it comes to restaurants i know this is going to sound horrible i'm just fine with mcdonald's i know you're saying why is that um because they're bland there's nothing special going on and yet millions and millions and millions of cows get murdered every day so that we can eat them at mcdonald's I know you're saying that's exaggerating. Yes, it is a little bit. Not millions and millions and millions of cows get killed every day. Um, but yeah, to me, it's I don't really need to own. If I were to go with another restaurant, I'd probably say something like Starbucks for the long term. But Starbucks gets a little sticky when it goes into China. And having to get the right scenarios into play for instance if you go to a starbucks in italy all you're going to find are other tourists and local teenagers Uh, you're not going to find anyone anyone local so to speak restaurants can get kind of fun in that way um cheesecake factory was a company that had five great years of growth and maybe that's how i should explain this if i were to own a restaurant company other than mcdonald's or starbucks it would be for five years 
there was a company that I owned for a very short period of time. And I don't really like talking about short term trades, but it was, it was, um, uh, now I'm PF Chang's and I went on Fox, Fox business. Uh, this was probably back in 98, 99. And I was on the Neil Cavuto business show. Oh, no, I was on Forbes on Fox. Uh, I was also on the Neil Cavuto business show and he's a wonderfully pleasant man, but uh, Forbes on Fox, they had a editor from Forbes a guy named Jesse. And, um, I was supposed to come with two stock picks and one of my stock picks was PF Chang's. And what I liked about PF Chang's was that they were going from four restaurants to 10 restaurants to 40 restaurants to a hundred restaurants to 200 restaurants. And that happens over a five year period. And that's, that's, I'm making up those numbers. Um, but I like restaurants when they're at that growth phase because wall street goes, Holy mackerel, look at the growth. And then people start talking about it. So I go on Forbes on Fox and one of my two stock picks was PF Chang's and Jesse goes, there's no shortage of Chinese restaurants in America. And I didn't know that I was going to be yelled at. I, I was in shock. I instantly started shaking a little bit. And then I'm like, I'm on national TV. Get your, your stuff together, Rob rebound from this. And I'm like, that's right. But P.F. Chang's isn't a Chinese restaurant. And everyone knows it's a Chinese restaurant. So he goes, it is a Chinese restaurant. And I said, no, P.F. stands for Paul Fleming. And he's a famous New York uh, steakhouse. You've probably heard of Fleming's. And I said, there's really nothing about Chinese that is P.F. Chang's. It's, it's really Americanized Chinese food. And it's yummy and it's delicious. And Americans across the country feel like they're eating international food when they go to P.F. Chang's. So I kind of saved myself. But I was scared. I did not see that one coming. Um, and that stock went on to double that year because the number of stores that they were opening. Um, same thing you can take a look at Chipotle in the last 20 years or last 15 years. You can see as they've gone from a regional restaurant to a national restaurant and as they start filling in all the, the holes in between, the, the store sales look great. Um, I do like Chipotle as a, a potential investment idea for people. It seems to be a very well-run company as far as uh, efficiencies go. But again, consult a broker for advisor for taking action on any stocks ever mentioned on the show. So Ruth's Chris Steakhouse, gone to Darden Restaurants. And again, I don't really need to own restaurants, but if I do, I just told you how I do it. I would own McDonald's and or Starbucks as my long-term names. Maybe you can convince me of another one. Maybe you can convince yourself of another one, but make a good case for it. My case on McDonald's is they've been around since 1950s, that we all know that their food's not good for you. We all know that America's getting more obese, and it didn't help when they came out with supersized sodas and supersized fries. One minute. Um, what would cause me to go against McDonald's? I probably only thing that could happen is if the CEO were to go loco in the cocoa and say we're ending all hamburger sales and we're replacing it with um, cardboard, <laughs> which some people think they did, but uh, that's neither here nor there. So yeah, I don't even get as far as like yum brands. Like I'm, I'm simple. I'm kind of boring and unsexy when it comes to those investment ideas in the restaurant industry. And again, Ruth's Crest Steakhouse, you would think big fat stop profit margins. You could probably say, yeah, when the economy comes back, power dinners are going on there. It's just not my thing. Really, I think one of the lessons I'm learning this week is know your thing, what you're comfortable with when it comes to investing. Find me online at Rob Black Show, Twitter, Rob Black Show, YouTube, Rob Black Show. You are listening to the Rob Black Show podcast. For more information on EP Wealth, visit robblack.com. That's robblack.com. Bear markets can get frustrating. Markets that go sideways can get annoying. I just looked at the calendar and saw again that we're in the month of May. No big deal. We're in the middle of the week. That again tells me how fast time flies because it feels like, well, it feels like time's flying. And uh, it's a constant reminder that you need to get ready for retirement. Don't put off. Time will pass you by. Don't get enough saved for retirement. You're going to work longer and longer. Don't get saved enough for retirement and you're going to have problems with what retirement looks like for you. I am shocked at how inflation has affected my family in the last 24 months. My grocery bills, my vacation costs, 
um, wild. Again, my mortgage is not so much. I'm glad those are locked in, especially now. So I got a big event coming up talking a little bit about you. It's called Pints and Portfolio Sunday, May 7th, one, two, four. It's going to be an interesting event in large part because I've never done one of these, um, or at least for a very, very long time. You need to get a reservation, but it's all about getting a complimentary portfolio review. May 7th in San Rafael. It's a fun. It's informal. It's a meet and greet. I'm bringing along with me CFP Dan Fetterman. Dan is going to be talking uh, financial chit chat with you. This is a very informal event. It is a meet and greet. It's going to be between one and four. If you have any financial questions, great time to show up. Let's bring on CFP Dan Fetterman, talk a little bit about this and what is the financial snapshot portfolio review. Dan? Hey, good morning, Rob. How are you doing? Good morning. Well, um, yeah. So, I guess just to be clear, when we're uh, in this at this event, uh, we won't be doing the financial uh, snapshot at the event. That will be more of a, a follow up post event, right? A follow up. Um, so, yeah. Have you really? Um, gone into any kind of detail of uh, what your expectation is uh, about the event uh, because we'll be there for three hours. <laughs> um, what I was thinking is how when we when we go to uh, the, when we do these seminars every uh, couple months, uh, some of my favorite moments are right before the seminar begins and and, and also uh, right um, like in the in the break between. Um, you know, the first and the second hour, because that, that's usually a chance for me to meet some of the, the people who have signed up for the event. And, and you get to learn about their, uh, you know, just their personal stories. And I think that's kind of the most, the, the fun part about the, the job. Um, the, the snapshot part is when we can talk in more detail one-on-one um, where I can give a second opinion. Um, it does require some some kind of data gathering. Um, you know, trying not to be too intrusive, but it's kind of necessary to uh, for us to have a complete picture to understand uh, what kind of assets you have, uh, if there's any debts or mortgages or liabilities of any kind. Um, get an idea of your expenses, and then because that puts everything in context when I'm looking at the portfolio, uh, and then we can just have a discussion about if, if, uh, if you've, if it looks like you've saved enough, um, you know, for retirement or if you're in retirement, are you taking too much risk? Obviously everyone's situation is pretty different. Um, but yeah, that's kind of like the idea of, of this event. Yeah. Um, so you're going to be giving and again, I, I should really make that very clear. This is financial chit chat, have a beer, sit in the sunshine, ask questions. And then the follow up is you're going to book a Zoom call with the individual, but the getting to know people is super important. And um, when you get to know them, you get to know their age, their income, their assets, their liabilities. There's kind of a checklist of questions that every CFP has to go through. And this isn't a, a full portfolio review. That would be a lot more in depth. But it would include things like taking a look at your taxes, taking a look at your mortgages, taking a look at um, your children, see if you like your children. <laughs> That's a funny thing to say, but some people don't want to leave money to their their children, and some people do. So that's something that a CFP gets to do. Any final thoughts on this event on, uh, that I'm going to kick you off? Uh you know, I just I look forward to meeting you know those who sign up. Uh, it is kind of crunch time. The events on Sunday. Uh, yeah. I think I think we have a cutoff of tomorrow. So if you're going to, if you're thinking about signing up, it's probably a good time to do it like today. And yeah. uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to meet you. Yeah, thanks, Dan. It's uh, the cutoff's actually going to be Friday, but people can still sign up at Rob Black Show. It's Rob Black Show. It's called Pints and Portfolios. It is very non-traditional. It is a good chance to pick my brain, ask me about stocks that I own, uh, take a look at um, your portfolio, uh, get to know each other. We can't do the portfolio review while we're on site. That's actually um, brought up by compliances. It's probably not a good idea to be given financial advice after a beer or two. And I totally agree. So I thought that was cute. Anyhow, and anyway, you can sign up for the event at robblackshow.com. That's robblackshow.com. Some other stories of note today. Private payroll surged by 296,000 in April, much higher than expected. That's interesting. 
So private payrolls higher. We have a big jobs report on Friday. We have the Fed decision today. Layoffs have jumped to the highest level since late 2020. The number of job openings in the U.S. dropped to a nearly two-year low in March, and layoffs increased their highest point since December 2020. That's going to be bad news is good news, but does it get reflected in the stock market today? I'm telling you, the stock market's had a very good year so far. And based on when does the Fed stop, that's really going to be the area that uh, we can start saying, okay, let's get constructive. Because right now we're going to still see more damage from the higher interest rates through the next nine to 12 months. That is known. There will be damage done from the higher interest rates until they start cutting. Um, So we got nine to 12 months is the idea of watching the numbers get worse. Again, it doesn't always play out like that. Anyhow, CVS beat on earnings and revenue, but they lowered their profit outlook. This is a company that makes a lot of sense to a lot of investors, but not to me. I I don't know why. And what I'm trying to get at at this segment real quick here is sometimes you just got to say, I I don't know this one and I got to move on. I know a lot of investors chase individual stocks when they shun it. They don't get to know the companies as well as they should. They take big risks that they don't even know they're putting themselves into. But CVS for me is a retailer. I can look at their their financials and it makes total sense. And I can say uh, my family is going and getting more pharmaceuticals as we age. My mother died taking something like nine to 11 pills a day to manage various diseases and scenarios in her body. That stinks. Um, so when you go into CVS, you see the line for the pharmacist and you, you shop around. That's what bothers me. I just I don't find the inventory in CVS to ever compel me enough to think about it as an investment. Like when you're looking at like Tootsie Rolls on top of Viagra, I'm like, eh, just it not it doesn't work for me. I'm not saying it won't work for you, but as an investor, sometimes you gotta say nope. I'll find a different type of retailer. I'll find something I feel comfortable with. This is your money. You got to feel comfortable. Sign up for the event Pites and Portfolios today. It's a little bit of a registration process because we got to get to know you a little bit. And you can't come unless you sign up and register. You can learn more at robblackshow.com. This Sunday, join Rob Black in San Rafael for Pints and Portfolios, a less formal event at a local watering hole for those close to retirement with 500000 or more in investable assets. Drop by Sunday afternoon from 1 to 4 for a little sunshine, some financial chit-chat, and a complimentary portfolio review or financial snapshot from Dan Fetterman, CFP from EP Wealth Advisors. Whether you're on the road to retirement or already there, this financial snapshot can provide you with a second opinion analysis of where you are and highlight areas for improvement and opportunities for growth. Go to robblackshow.com and click the events tab. Find Pints and Portfolios and click to register. You'll answer a few simple questions about your situation and your confirmation email will provide all the details on the event and how to schedule your portfolio review. Space is limited and registration is required, so go to robblackshow.com today. That's robblackshow.com.